everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Uh, today is Saturday, October 14th, and I'm James May, Program Officer at CGS. Drea is uh, monitoring the chat, so please don't hesitate to reach out to her or the general chat uh, who can help you with tech support today. Um, of course, the author of today's book is Manu uh, Bhagavan. Um, I'll give him a, a better introduction once we've gone through housekeeping. Um, we're recording today's session, as we've just said, um, and it will be available on CGS's YouTube channel by the mid of next week. Uh, this, if this is anybody's first time, I want to give you a big welcome and uh, ask you if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself, perhaps. Is there anybody new today who'd like to say hello? No? Okay, I'll continue. Um, CGS's book club is an opportunity to read and discuss classic and contemporary books on world citizenship and world federation in depth and learn unique insights from authors uh, and have empowering conversations that provide a forum for exchange of ideas. I'd like to give the opportunity for any new members, sorry, I'm over repeating, uh, because we uh, did run out of time last, uh, during the last session, um, because we had so many great comments and questions. I'm going to ask you uh, to keep your comments to just two minutes. Um, and if you go over that, I will remind you and ask you to wrap up. Um, uh, I'd also like you to limit your questions to one person, uh, one question per person until you've, uh, until we've gone through the cycle of everybody asking questions, if you'd like to do that. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody has the chance to engage with Manu. Um, does anybody have any objections to that ground rule? No. Okay, great. Um, the schedule will remain the same uh, as last week, and we'll open up for questions at around 12.30. Um, you can raise your virtual hand or your physical hand on screen, and I'll put your, or put your questions in the chat box um, if you don't want to speak. Um, We'll stop with about 10 minutes before the end of the session at around 1.20 for any announcements that people would like to make about relative events or things that you want to promote. So please hold those kinds of comments or questions until the end of the session. So now I'm extremely pleased to introduce our guest author for today, Manu uh, Bhagavan, who is history, uh, Professor of History, Human Rights and Public Policy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center the City University of New York, where he's also a senior fellow at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. He's the author and editor of seven books. Um, I would also like to ask Manu to plug his upcoming books, which we can't get to wait, uh, wait to get our hands on. Um, that'll come in a moment. Uh, Drea will put Manu's website and Twitter handle in the chat, if any of you would like to follow up and get in touch with him. Uh, today is the second session on Manu's book, which is The Peacemakers, and I'd like to hand over to, uh, over to Manu now, who will tell us why he wrote the book and give us highlights and insights um, from the prologue and chapters three and four, which is the subject of today's session. So now over to you, Manu. Thanks very much. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, James, uh, for um, the welcome comments. Nice to see all of you again. Um, I must say, I don't think in all the years this book has been out that I have ever had the opportunity to discuss it in such an extensive fashion over multiple sessions or multiple months with uh, the same group of people. So I appreciate both the interest and the opportunity. Um, I don't think I should go any further, however, at the moment, um, and some people feel the this particular moment, perhaps more personally than others. And um, before we got started, I know that's true of some of the people on this call as well. Um, so I just want to take a moment uh, to recognize um, the terrible tragedy that's taking place uh, uh, in Israel and Palestine that has been taking place for the last week or so. Um, and uh, as tragedy builds upon tragedy um, and uh, express my sympathies with anyone who might personally be feeling it, or if you're empathizing with it from a distance, I think sympathies are still in order. Um, and I also mentioned to Drea that it's at moments like these, and they seem to be coming ever more frequently, unfortunately, that we're all meant 
and we do feel so ever more isolated and helpless. Um, and so I just feel like it's also important to say that that helplessness is felt by many people, but that united and uh, we, we're not in fact helpless, that there are things that we can do um, both in terms of sending aid to those who are the victims of violence um, and in terms of raising our voices in various capacities against um, this continued bloodshed um, and, uh, and to advocate for whatever mechanisms of reconciliation uh, we can. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive my indulgence in starting that way, but I did think it's important. Um, this is a, a, a talk on, um, on world events and world solutions. And so I, I don't see any other way uh, to to do so to start. Okay, um, so uh, I'm I'm um, uh, I'm happy to talk about um, the two chapters uh, that um, are the focus of today's talk uh, showdown in sorry today's conversation showdown in San Francisco and the new hope. Um, you know the. The new, so I think James said that I, again, I'm supposed to say why I wrote this book. Um, and I, I have, of course, completely forgotten what I said the last time. But um, the, the new hope uh, was the way this book began. Uh, I, I was originally planning to write, uh, I, I, had finished my first book and I was in, you know, thinking about new directions. And um, I had been in and out of India for a bit and I, I, had, I had grown concerned with what I saw as a number of policy failures and the, the directions that the country had, the direction the country had been moving for some time. And so I was interested in, in juxtaposing that with some of the founding ideals of the country. Uh, and uh, I was particularly interested in the debates around the imagination of what the country was supposed to be at the uh, at the end of the colonial period and the beginning of the independence period. And so I had um, gone to do some preliminary research with my intent of looking at a few different intellectuals. And the very first intellectual that I, whose papers I opened because she had appeared in my previous book was this woman named Hansa Mehta, who you see appears in today's uh, chapters uh, in, the, uh, in the New Hope section on universalizing human rights. Uh, so Hansa Mehta's father uh, had uh, been an important political person in one of the states I'd studied for my first book, and she herself was uh, influential in that state as well. So I started looking through her papers and uh, found all this stuff on human rights that I had no idea about. I did not know when I started that she was involved in human rights. And that tells you something right there. This was back in um, 2006, 2006. Uh, that tells you something right there because I, you know, I'm a, I'm a specialist in the field. I'm a specialist on 20th, 20th century India. And I had no idea, I, no one did as a matter of fact, because it just wasn't written about or talked about. Uh, so I was like, what is this? What? She, here's this person who was very influential with the United Nations and looks like she's played a big role with uh, human rights. And I didn't quite know exactly what that meant. Uh, and so I, uh, this is a true story. Um, I drafted a talk, uh, I drafted a, a, a paper uh, on, on this stuff, on India and the United Nations. And I, I found it very interesting. And I was scheduled to give a talk in Leiden um, uh, on, cart on like imagined cartographies. And I decided that this was a more interesting kind of paper and I bumped it and I put, put this paper in, in place of something I was gonna do before. And uh, at, at, at any rate, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was walking down the street in New York and uh, there was a whole gaggle of people, and I went up to them and I said, "Oh, what's what's uh, what's going on here?" And they said, "Oh, it's the band Aerosmith. They are signing autographs." Um, and I said, "Oh, Aerosmith. I'm, well, I I like Aerosmith, and I would really like to get their autograph." 
So Steven Tyler was not there, but the rest of the band was. So I fished around in my bag and the only thing I had was a copy of my paper. Um, and so I took that out and Aerosmith assigned my paper. So for, for what it's worth, that paper and ergo the chapter we're talking about today has been endorsed by Aerosmith. Um, uh, and that, that, that's been my uh, go-to go line about this for, for many years because it's also one of my favorite stories. It's true. Um, so at any rate, I, uh, I finished this and um, the paper uh, got some excitement, generated some excitement, and I decided that I was kind of, I was interested in sort of boring down on this a bit more. And as I began to explore, I came across, that's how I came across originally this term one world. And I did not know what it meant. I had never heard of it before in an Indian context. And I was trying to figure out what they were talking about. And um, so that that is how the book began. And I, um, I grew interested from that particular paper. And I wound up in India where I was actually scheduled to start work on a different book. And I wound up in a meeting with the head of HarperCollins and uh, they offered me a contract on the spot uh, and said, write this book. Uh, and um, that's how I wrote the book. Um, so I hope I didn't repeat what I said the last time, but this, that's the, this is, this is uh, part of the story. Um, okay, so uh, these two chapters um, are uh, important because they bring us into conversation now with the foundation of the United Nations um, and with this kind of really big landmark moment uh, for India at the United Nations, which is the debate on South Africa, on the South African question. Now, I should say that the material in these two chapters, um, the chapters are, are good in the context of this book, but because they involve this particular character of the book, um, Madame Pandit, um, the story as I now understand it has considerably evolved since when I wrote this originally. And the reason is because my new book, which is uh, imminent, uh, coming out in December, uh, is a biography of Madame Pandit. And it is a very extensive thing. It has taken me um, eight years and over 40 archives uh, in um, seven countries. Uh, so, and um, I don't know if I said this right, and five languages. Material in five languages. So it's, uh, it's, uh, and uh, the yeah, the, I, I just finished the proofs, and, and I'm supposed to send the book uh, to the printer in the next five days to complete it. Uh, so Andrea sent out these uh, extra links uh, to talk about, you know, like some background to Madame Pennant. I didn't ask her to do that, by the way. Um, I was I was uh, very excited because it gives me a chance to a little bit introduce you to uh, to more about um, uh, this particular person. Um, and I think um, the best part of the things that she sent was that you get to see her on in these video interviews, as well as the audio interviews. And um, I think that they're, they're very revealing in lots of ways. Um, okay, so uh, in a nutshell, uh, showdown in San Francisco, uh, brings um, Madame Pandit to the United States where she coordinates efforts with the NAACP and particularly Walter White and W.E.B. Du Bois to travel to the West Coast where she is going to represent an alternate delegation to the United Nations Conference. The official delegation uh, are representatives of the British government. Um, the British government in India, uh, and to clarify how it is that the British government in India has seats at the table at the United Nations Conference, it's because um, of a fluke that because of at the time of the foundation of the League of Nations, um, India was in, and so India was the only non-free country, I believe this is correct, uh, the only non-independent country to have a seat at the League 
uh, and then they have a legacy seat at the United Nations Conference because of that. And that's how the country gets out. Of course, it's in England's interest to do that because the Indians who sit on that seat or represent the British government of India, so they get extra extra voice. And Churchill is very, uh, he, he's very aware of this. I mean, he, he's extremely savvy and, uh, you know, he knows that each one of these seats gives England a, a boost, to the, it boosts England's voice at the table. Uh, so um, there are three people representing uh, the British government of India formally, uh, but uh, she comes in and sucks out all of the air from the room, uh, attracting kind of worldwide attention, uh, kind of on, just on the sheer force of her personality. Um, and the chapter does a pretty good job. Um, I, I, I've done a better job in my new in my new thing, uh, but a pretty good job of walking us through some of the. Um, um, encounters that she has while she's on the West Coast. Um, and uh, um, by this point, she's a fairly well-known name. She's achieved a type of celebrity status because of her debate at Town Hall in New York with Robert Boothby. That's nationally broadcast. It was all, all over the press. And now she's known as Madam Pandit. But I don't think um, it's not in here because I didn't know it at the time, but it is in my new book. Uh, just to give you an indication uh, of how famous she is by this point, how big a deal she is. Uh, and again, in the clips that Drea sent, you can see her the, repeatedly in these interviews, the, some of them, one was 1949 with the International uh, uh, Women's League uh, for Peace and Freedom and um, the other one, Another one that she sent was um, 1959, while she's High Commissioner to the UK. Uh, and in both of them, they keep referring to her as one of the most distinguished women in the world and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here's an example of that uh, and how soon it happened. So she's had this uh, town hall. She comes to the West Coast. Uh, she's busy doing these things. Uh, and uh, she uh, goes... In between the meetings, she goes to a cafe. She's sitting at the cafe and having some coffee. And this huge storm of people kind of see her in the window. And uh, the, the gap, it's huge, like, uh, you know, like fanboys and girls, they, 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 they're screaming. Think the Beatles, Beatles mania. They're like screaming. And they come in and they mob her at the table. And they're asking for her autograph, like screaming. And right next to her, but completely alone with no one at their table is James Cagney, you know, legendary Hollywood actor and uh, the big, one of the biggest names of the day. Uh, and so, I mean, I think uh, this particular story really helps to illustrate the kind of celebrity she had achieved. Uh, and it's uh, very difficult, I think, for a modern audience to, to, to sort of grasp the idea that A, um, a, a, a person who is coming from abroad and has only been here for a very brief period of time um, and is a politician, um, you know, she's a political figure, uh, but can achieve this kind of um, deep, deeply saturated uh, form of popularity uh, in the United States, which she did. So she, that, that kind of charisma and popularity is what she's bringing against uh, uh, the official delegates uh, at the at the UN um, conference um, and also against Churchill's team. Uh, anyway, um, we can talk about the details in a nutshell. What happens is uh, this goes back and forth. Uh, she achieves a lot of press coverage, but she ultimately she fails in her endeavor. She's pushing back against notions of uh, um, she is pushing back against the idea that the United Nations should carry forward particular colonial understandings. Uh, the United States uh, raises some questions along these lines and Britain convinces them to go along with the language of trusteeship. And the British Foreign Office is very pleased with this because trusteeship they think uh, embeds the language of uh, the colonial system into the UN Charter, and this will now uh, 
be perpetuated ad infinitum. This is their view. This is the in inner view of the British Foreign Office. Uh, and so it's uh, quite astonishing that this is turned on its head uh, almost immediately thereafter, which is the next chapter in The New Hope. Uh, so she leaves kind of quite disappointed. She feels like she's failed. She's lost against Churchill. Nothing really happens. The charter goes into effect. It contains this language. She knows that the, the thing is over. And she the tour continues for some time thereafter. Uh, but after this happens and the and the um uh, the conference ends, the kind of magic moment is over. And she's still doing things, but she's you know, she sort of feels like she's failed and she's a little bit disappointed. The energy's gone out of her and the room. And eventually she's, she goes back to India where she's uh, very warmly received. And she's very upset, but her brother tries to con console her by saying, you don't really know like the consequences of this kind of thing. So don't, don't take it to heart too much. We don't know where this is headed. Just let's leave it and we'll see. So she gets to India uh, and uh, very quickly she's um, sent back this time to New York. Uh, to attend uh, the first sessions of the um, new United Nations. Um, and the question at play is the South Africa question. Um, and this too is something where I, I was very proud of what I'd done in this book, um, but I managed to tease it out in all kinds of new ways uh, in, the new, in the new book, because I, I just have a lot more details and information on it. Um, but in, in a nutshell, again, um, Over time, the Asiatic Land Tenure Act uh, had gone into effect, essentially making um, Indian migrants in South Africa into second-class citizens. And the local population there were growing increasingly upset. And interestingly, the British, government's, British government uh, in India and uh, the UK were both kind of raising some questions of concern. Um, and um, so as the new United Nations comes into being, um, they uh, uh, have an interest, um, the interim government, Gandhi and uh, the British reps have an interest in her going to debate the South African question uh, at the UN. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because ultimately the British take the side, the British take the side of um, uh, South Africa. So in any event, they uh, they head back, uh, she heads back to, to New York um, and engages in this big debate. Um, she, there are some very big, prominent uh, British legal minds involved, like Hartley Shawcross um, and some other very eloquent speakers. Um, but she eventually defeats one after the other uh, in, in oratorical combat. But this leads to this big moment, this big defining moment where uh, the UN General Assembly comes together and Jan Smuts himself comes to deliver remarks. Uh, and he's been there all along. And I should say that uh, Gandhi is very clear to her that she's never to do anything to personally attack Smuts uh, or to make it in any way um, offensive uh, to South African people, South African white people, that this is about policy and she's meant to keep this very uh, high, highly calibrated. Um, and so the two of them hang out quite a bit at parties and uh, they're always off to the corner talking uh, during this moment. Um, there's some interesting tidbits there, but I'll share that later. Um, at any rate, uh, they go head to head uh, and she delivers this soaring oratory uh, in her big evening moment before the General Assembly. It's front page news all over the world. She calls the body the conscience of the world. Uh, and uh, she goes on to win the two thirds majority, which was what was required um, to win. Um, and uh, again, becomes this super sensation. Um, this South Africa question is very important for this group, I mean, all of you, uh, because this is the precedent this sets the precedent for the United Nations to act in ways that I think all of you are interested in, which is um, the UN Charter has something called Article 27, which is the Domestic Jurisdiction Clause. And it basically says that states are protected by domestic jurisdiction can do whatever that they want and the international 
uh, bodies should not interfere in the domestic affairs of member states. Um, but uh, Madam Pandit, it's Pandit, but um, anglicized it's Pandit, um, turns this on its head and uh, talks about uh, some other elements within the preamble of the charter, uh, how important human rights are, she uses the phrase, uh, and, uh, and that um, because people are members of the UN in certain ways, that automatically means that certain elements supersede the idea of domestic jurisdiction. Uh, and so ultimately what this means is that, uh, also which is clear here, that um, state sovereignty cannot be used to shield states uh, from uh, internal actions which are detrimental to the larger cause of humanity um, and uh, or human rights. Uh, and so when the Human Rights Commission is called into being um, the Henri Langer, uh, uh, of the UN makes it clear that the South Africa question is one of the key precedents. The results of the South Africa debate are one of the key precedents that allows um, the UN now to have the ability to intervene in member states' domestic affairs if they violate the norms which are established to protect uh, um, its internal citizens or transient peoples within those states. Um, so this is a very, very important um, legal uh, principle. And then the, 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 uh, uh, the end of that chapter deals with universalizing human rights. Uh, so I think I've come to the exact minute that um, uh, James asked for us to be able to talk about questions. And I want to momentarily give myself a pat on the back because as, as an academic, um, this is a an incredibly impossible feat uh, for me to actually shut up at the exact minute that uh, that I am supposed to. But nonetheless, here we are. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Well, not only a wonderful presentation, but um, time well kept spent and kept as well. Um, so I'll now open the floor for questions. Um, if you'd like to raise your virtual hand or physical hand, if you'd like to pose a question, I would just remind you, try to keep it to two minutes, and I'll ask you to wrap up if you go over them. Um, who'd like to go first? Bruce, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm Bruce Knotts, and I've actually spent uh, about 15 years at the United Nations as a civil society representative. And so I'm very interested in, in your book and uh, this history that I didn't know that much about. So thank you for, for teaching me. Uh, I was at a meeting just the other day at the UN about transitional justice, and I brought up the issue of Syria, which uh, I, I said in my remarks um, a decade ago, there was a big debate at the UN as to whether Bashar al-Assad should be indicted for human rights violations under, with, under the uh, International Criminal Court, or if we should work for peace and take care of the justice later. The decision was to take care of peace and to take care of justice later. And of course, Syria is still in the midst of war. There is no peace and there is no justice. And so my comment was that justice should come first or should be a leading edge in peace. And I also mentioned that that has application to what's going on now in Israel, uh, Palestine, and that really there needs to be some justice because they've tried to work on peace and peace without justice is not gonna work. So I'm wondering about your, your thoughts on that topic. Um, Bruce, it's very nice to meet you and let me thank you for starting us off on this um, obviously easy easy question for me to handle and, 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 uh, and just uh, <laughs> be able to, to uh, I, I mean, you're asking literally like the toughest the, the toughest thing possible uh, to start us off. Um, okay, let, let's see a, a couple of things. Um, so I am, I'm, I work at Roosevelt House, which is part of Hunter, and we're also in the process of trying to become a, a United Nations civil society organization, I, and, and where that process is. Ralph Bunch Institute at the Graduate Center, which I'm also affiliated with, has that has that standing as well. Um, and uh, I have also had the opportunity of um, 
uh, meeting and, and talking over in various instances with the ICC prosecutors, the founding prosecutor, um, uh, Mourinho Ocampo, and uh, successor uh, Fatua Ben Souda. Um, and uh, so I've, uh, I've, you know, had some opportunity to discuss and mull over the kinds of issues and queries you're talking about, um, although it, it, um, uh, the, the particular context and, and things, situations, mm, I, I think differ from circumstance to circumstance. You know, when we're talking about the Middle East, uh, there are very complicated and nuanced histories, some of which are kind of local and immediate, and they're still complicated and nuanced and deep. Uh, and then some of them have longer histories. Uh, and these longer histories, by longer histories, by the way, I mean that they can go back 100 years or 200 years. That's long history. Forget the thing that people say, these are 2,000 year things. I mean, that's whatever. But but 100 or 200 years has plenty of history to it and, and are, is very difficult to unravel. Um, you know what I, I would say to your question, obviously justice is, is necessary and is a good thing, but what justice means and how it can be meted out in the context of ongoing conflicts is a difficult one to address. And we don't have to look very far to see how things can misfire with the best of intentions. We only need to look, for instance, to what happened in Libya, um, where Muammar Gaddafi over many years would sort of say one thing and do another. He was high on rhetoric. Uh, and um, I think fair to say, quite delusional. I mean, he, he really believed a lot of the things that he was saying and a lot of the things he was saying, he thought he was like some kind of prophet and, and saint and that he was bringing what he called real democracy to Libya with people's councils. And while he, and he also believed he wasn't living it up the way a lot of other people were. He believed he, he lived in tents and things like this. And he thought, you know, he, he thought he was beloved. Um, uh, now, while that's true, uh, and and while uh, Libya under his leadership had previously done uh, other things, and then in the context of the Arab Spring, there was uh, uprising. The idea of regime change, uh, you know, sort of driving in and removing him, and then leaving this place upended, uh, has has um, really cost. Uh, the Libyan people quite seriously and has damaged the credibility of people who pushed through resolutions at the UN under certain premises and then they didn't sort of really abide by what they were going to say. Uh, and unfortunately, this particular example, I think, is part of a larger pattern. Uh, and that's where we get into trouble. I think we really fundamentally cannot escape the old imperial relationships. Um, and um, oftentimes color lines that are associated with those. And so I, you know, the idea that a brutal dictator like Assad, and let's make no mistake that that's what he is, you know, it, actually it's funny because I, I remember when Bashar al-Assad came to power uh, as the son, and for a period of time, everyone thought he was going to be quite different from his father, Hafez al-Assad, and that he would he would be a modernizer. In fact, now that I think about it, I believe the same exact thing was said for uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. Um, and unfortunately, both of them have turned out to be worse tyrants than their than their fathers ever were. Um, now that said, what do we do? They're the the heads of states uh, and. Um, to talk about bringing justice to them when uh, they have arsenals at their disposal, I think puts them, you know, pushes them back into corners. And Assad in particular has shown that he has no compunctions whatsoever of using the deadliest of all weapons at his disposal against his own people or against anyone. He, he, he doesn't care. Uh, and, and he'll do whatever he needs to. Um, so I think that, um, um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we need, we need to 
proceed cautiously. Um, and um, this is the kind of thing where I would feel uncomfortable saying anything beyond these kinds of general statements because I would, I feel two things. Um, in general, uh, I think that I would prefer to defer to people with actual detailed expertise on this particular matter and, and subject. Um, and to the extent that people like me might have a role is to ask questions from a more general perspective uh, and to see if maybe that can help them see things from a different perspective while they operate in their deeply knowledgeable ways. Um, but the second thing I would say is that it is it's also whether I have deep expertise or not, I think like really boring into the details becomes very important here. What happened at that particular moment? How do we act in this instance? Um, and we don't have, we haven't gotten into that here and I don't have all of that at my fingertips and I would want that in order to be more specific. Uh, and I don't think it, the issue can be dealt with in injustice, with justice, uh, unless I did that. So, thank, happy thank you. Thank you, Manu. Um, David, you raised your hand virtually earlier, and now David, sorry, that was David Gallup earlier, and David Orton just now physically. Da uh, David Gallup, would you like to, to ask? Um, did I? Well, I do actually have a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't think I did, but anyway, yeah. So I'm working in a coalition to uh, create a, a World Court of Human Rights, and I noticed on page 71 that Hansa Mehta was also sort of interested in the same idea where she says she wanted to create a UN committee on human rights that would work in conjunction with an international court to hear cases by and against individuals, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering two, two things. One, um, how far that idea went or whether it was just kind of a, a stalled. Um, and the second part is even if that idea of, of having like a world court of human rights was, was stalled, did those ideas somehow uh, coalesce into the creation of the UN Human Rights uh, Council, which I think used to be called the Commission, but that they changed it to the Council more recently, and also the High Commissioner for Human Rights? Uh, yes, so the High Commissioner on Human Rights is in fact, um, uh, in my view, like something that I wouldn't necessarily call a derivative of her idea, um, I, tracing intellectual ideas to points of origin like that can be complicated because there's all kinds of things. I, I would certainly say that that High Commissioner is consonant with some of the things that she was talking about uh, in terms of having like a lead person being able to push push the human rights agenda. Um, I, in the end of the book, I do say, um, uh, I believe uh, that. Uh, the International Court of Justice is where they land, is what they land on as the site to prosecute these kinds of bigger kinds of cases. Um, and uh, there's some, they leave it at that at the time, uh, because that's all, like, everything that they're talking about, there's this distinction between the ideal of it and the real politique of it. Um, and they have to figure out what they can settle on uh, and still, and still, kind of move the needle in the direction that they want. I mean, it's not about settling, but it's about this is a real step forward. Uh, and I think that's also a distinction that um, is important to bear in mind. These are, these are pragmatic idealists who are operating. They have a big vision, they have a goal, but they also know how to, you know, how to take a win uh, and to say, okay, we'll, we'll move this here. Um, looking back on it, it can say, it's easy to say, oh, well, they didn't accomplish anything. They didn't accomplish what they set out to, or they compromised and they compromised and they compromised. Um, I, there's no way forward without compromise. You're always going to meet people who oppose you. And unless you're willing to, to meet them halfway, you know, if you bulldoze the people who oppose you into victory, all that you're going to do is set them up for long-term opposition. Um you know, it's. I think that sometimes idealists can live under the under the view that if only people would, if my idea came into being, everyone would see how great it is. 
Um, and I don't actually think that's the case. I think if it comes into being, people are pushed into finding fault with it when maybe there might not be a fault. So it's better to bring them along slowly, in my view, than it is to try to sort of win it all at once and then and just move forward. There are counter examples, of course, revolutionary ones. Um, at big revolutionary moments, you change and upend uh, at the, you know, at the expense of the opposition completely. But even then, um, you know, remnants of the people who opposed you are still brought back into society in various ways, uh, and that can still have long-term consequences uh, for the duels of the duel of ideas. Uh, so that's what I'd say. Um, in terms of a, a new court, um, I I don't think that, um, I, I think the idea in theory might be a good one. I don't have enough uh, knowledge of the project you're involved with or, or the details. I can say that I had once upon a time several very interesting conversations with William Pace um, at, who, among many hats that he wore, ran the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Um, and uh, we talked about the Rome Statute, and we talked about the kind of steps that have to be taken in order to evolve a kind of international legal mechanism. Uh, and the International Criminal Court at the time, I mean, I remember w William and others being jubilant that the thing came into being. Um, and I attended... Um, God, I don't remember his last name, Bradley something. Uh, I attended some fancy event where Bradley, this painter named Bradley, had, he was affiliated with this, had uh, done all of these paintings of people that the court had prosecuted. And I grew deeply uncomfortable very fast. We were in the home of some some New York fancy something or other. I, I don't remember what street, but I'll just say it's like some kind of Park Avenue type apartment, you know, something like this to give you an idea. Uh, and the, the home was decked out with unbelievable real uh, art and all of this stuff. And then Bradley's paintings were everywhere and they were all of, you know, black African leaders. And um, it, it was it, it was so incredibly uncomfortable for me almost immediately because it was it was completely oblivious to the racial overtones of what was happening and the and the imper old imperial overtones. It's not that any of these African dictators were good people. They were terrible people, but it was about the selective power of the court, who it was going to be able to prosecute in order to ratchet up victories, in order to say that it had some legitimacy, in order to get power. And it's also about ratification and who's going to go along with it and who's arm twisted into going along with it. So I think, um, you know, again, generating legal mechanisms, the, the, having judiciaries that are truly universal is a very challenging task. Um, and I think uh, it, all caution needs to be taken to ensure that uh, as many different kinds of peoples are brought in um, in order to really validate the thing that you're creating. Um, now, having said that, the other issue becomes states or leaders who have no interest in actually ever being prosecuted. Um, and they have this sort of sense of, of uh, a legitimacy or like they're, they're above and beyond these, these kinds of things. And we have them here in this country uh, as well as everywhere else. Uh, and so to the extent that what you're evolving is something that can bring justice to those kinds of folks, well, then, you know, all power to you. So it's this delicate thing. It's a high wire act. I think that you, you need to walk. We need to walk. Um, but I am, you know, people of goodwill can achieve great things. Thank you, Manu. Thank you, David, for the question. Uh, David Orton, you, you had your hand up. And if I might just say, um, I don't know if I missed anybody putting up their physical or digital hands. If I did, please raise it again. Um, David. You're uh, muted, sorry. You're, you're muted. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. Um, 
I imagine that uh, Rebecca might want to respond to the latest uh, comments uh, that you made, Manu. Uh, I wanted to say that um, I was very interested in the section in chapter four on the South African question because I saw that as the seeds to what di has developed as the R2P principle, uh, the responsibility to protect principle. But uh, again, even though it's a principle, as you mentioned, the problem always is enforcement. Uh, the Syrian issue, along with all the other conflicts that have developed. And in that section, I was especially interested in the sentence where Gandhi was telling uh, Madame Pandit that the UN uh, should not become a debating society. But that's exactly what has uh, developed over the years because of the lack of enforcement uh, over R2P and uh, other issues. So I just wanted to uh, make that comment to say that I think that that section about South Africa was very interesting. Uh, but as long as the UN continues to uh, lack enforcement, and that the principles of the ICC are not universal, uh, we're gonna continue to have the conflicts that we have in Ukraine and Israel and on and on and on and on. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, uh, David. Um, well, I mean, I agree with what you said. Um, uh, I. I sort of respond in two ways, I think. Um, I mentioned William Bill Pace. Um, and um, as, as I recall, I think among the other hats he wore was the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect. Um, and so I, I also recall some conversations to, to this effect. Um, Bill Pace was very good friends with um, Jonathan Fanton who was our founding director at Roosevelt House. Um, and we have had uh, many conversations on this uh, there. And Ralph Bunch, I think also we have uh, people related to this particular concept. Uh, and I have been interested in it uh, for some time. I think, in fact, we also discussed this with Kofi Annan way back in the day, um, uh, who claimed this as one of his big uh, one of the big achievements, as I recall. Um, the point about the UN as a debating society that Gandhi made and now that it is, you know, that uh, that's not an accident. It's not an accident that it became a debating society. Um, that was a, a very purposeful transition, which occurs over the 19, late 1950s, but particularly in the 1960s. Uh, and the reason for it is the dramatic transformation of the United Nations into, in fact, a much more democratic institution. What happens is decolonization, particularly in Africa, and a large number of decolonized countries move into the UN. They take seats at the UN and they begin to alter the dynamics of the institution, the body, the, you know, the, the framing of questions and conversations and the power dynamics of the institution. And um, I, think I, I think I mentioned this in here, but maybe it's in the next, at the end of the book, I can't remember anymore. Um, the General Assembly in its conception was one of several of the equal arms of the UN. And that's where I think it's also challenging for many of us today to understand why Madame Pandit was a big deal in her day. She was president of the UN General Assembly. If I ask you today to name the president of the UN General Assembly, and all of you are probably the most attuned to this kind of thing of anyone on the planet, I think many of us would be hard pressed to know who it is. I mean, there was a moment uh, where, um, what's her name? Um, Madam Garcia, Garcia um, I can't remember her last name, sorry. Madam Garcia, well, that even tells you. And I know her, uh, she, she became um, the, the third or the fourth woman president of the UNGA, uh, Espinosa, uh, Garcia Espinosa. Uh, she she um, 
there, there was a moment where there was a little bit more energy uh, around that. But again, it's a position that doesn't attract a whole lot of attention anymore. And so it's hard for us to wrap our, our minds around the fact that someone who held that position would be a global celebrity. Um, but that's the way it was, because at the time, president of the UN, UNGA was actually the position that was kind of seen as president of the world. Um, not kind of, that's literally what it was talked about as they were president of the world. Um, and, the, you know, today, when we think about the head of the UN, we only think of the UN secretary general. Uh, and so the secretary general was a big deal. And obviously it was when she was president of the UNGA as well, because guess who was secretary general in her day? Dag Hammarskjöld. Um, and so this was, this, this is obviously Trigby Lee and all that before that, but, but, um, the point is, is that um, 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 Lester Pearson and all of these people uh, have played important roles. Lester Pearson had been president of the UNGA before um, Madam Pendant. So um, the, the point in, in, in saying all of this is that what the UN was in the 40s and the 50s is not what it became soon thereafter in her own lifetime. Uh, and um, what I document somewhere. I think it's at the end of this book, but I've written a whole bunch after it. I don't know where I put it anymore. Uh, but but somewhere, um, the the Western powers uh, were growing increasingly uncomfortable with uh, the change dynamic and a shifted power to the Security Council. Uh, and they, they kind of de-emphasized the UNGA. Um, and um, when all the power sort of shifted to the Security Council and the Secretary General, the UN itself began to feel less responsive and legitimate. And gradually, by the 1960s, people were, even in the clip that Drea sent, um, by the late 50s, people were asking questions about what is this institution doing? What is its power? What is its influence? And is it worth it? Um, and um, I, the answer was, the people were growing increasingly um, wary uh, of the UN and um, um, marginalizing it even by even by the late period while she was still there and some of these people were still very active. Uh, so that it turns into a debating society because the power of the UNGA is taken away and it's put into the hands of the more select group that's in the Security Council. Uh, and then they, what do they do if they don't have any power? They sit around and talk, i.e. be a debating society. Brilliant. Uh, Joseph, you were next with your hand up. Would you like to uh, pose your question or comment? Sorry, Joseph, you unmuted yourself and then muted yourself again. If you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself. There you go. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, um, I'd like to turn from uh, Madame Pandit uh, to Gandhi himself and ask you a historical question. <clears throat> um, is it true that in the 30s, that is when Gandhi was at, at the height of his uh, moral power, uh, and the British even uh, provided a constitution in, for India in 1935. But uh, Gandhi was uh, asked what would be uh, his recommendation for how to deal with Adolf Hitler and the Nazi movement. And I think uh, this must have been a question uh, for the peace movement of the time, still under uh, the leadership of Romain Roland, after uh, Einstein had uh, moved to America and uh, had renounced uh, absolute pacifism. Well, Gandhi said, um, and this is what I'd like you to confirm, um, I, he said that what, what, what the West, or rather what the whole world should do is um, not take up arms and just like those of the Axis powers, but should try to practice nonviolent resistance. Uh, and what this would mean is that Hitler would probably conquer uh, Europe and uh, Russia and Japan would conquer Asia and 
Um, I suppose Italy would conquer Africa. But um, the bulk of humanity would save its moral character by not using the same violent methods uh, to dis defeat Hitler. Uh, and in the course of time, why uh, Nazism would probably become softer uh, and uh, short, slow processes of uh, human uh, understanding and reconciliation would uh, gradually w work a, a reversal of these conquests of Nazi Germany and its allies. Um, in retrospect, especially from your point of view as a student of uh, Indian history, it, first of all, did, did Gandhi actually say that? And secondly, is it possible that this that, that nonviolent resistance could actually be applied for such a large scale uh, global um, peace movement? Um, thank you, Joseph, uh, for this question, which I I love this question because um, it, it really gets to the heart of uh, a lot of things, and um, I think it, it is one that uh, uh, people who know some pe people who are familiar with some of the lesser known aspects of Gandhi uh, they they sort of pick up on this and and then they this, this raises a big concern. Uh, and so I think it is really important to address this. So let me um, back up a little bit to say a couple of different things uh, before I address the question specifically. Um, and I think there are two more questions and I know we I need to be over by 120, is that right? This is the kind of question that um, Joseph, I'm going to blame you entirely. You asked a historian a historical question on the exact subject of his true expertise. This is a very bad thing to do uh, in a situation like this because you know now I would go on. I can you know how, you know can I keep going until tomorrow? I mean like this is not this is this is my this is my so, real. So, so so the running order is uh, the plan was from twelve thirty to one to have historical questions and then from one till one twenty to have questions related to the uh, contemporary context. However, we've had a mix of questions so far. So I think, go for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I mean, the, the issue is I got to make sure I have room for the two remaining questions and, and not spend 20 minutes just on my answer here, which I easily can do. Uh, okay, so first of all, um, I mean, and by 20 minutes, I mean, that's when I would just finish the first sentence. Um, okay, so let's, let's go back for a second. Um, you know, Gandhi, first of all, achieves a fair amount of world renown, world renown when he goes to South Africa and he begins his campaigns in South Africa. So much of the Gandhi story, as is popularly understood, begins in Durban uh, and uh, the kinds of things that he did there. Most famously, Richard Attenborough's begins with him on the train and he's thrown off of the train and you know how can this thing happen and and he really questions all of this stuff um and he's long portrayed in the popular imagination as someone who's a champion of universal values and he stands against racism and all of this stuff i presume many of you know this version of the story of gandhi um and a few years ago uh some acquaintance, colleagues of mine, produced a book called The South African Gandhi. And it followed another book by another dis more distant acquaintance of mine, Joseph Lelyveld, uh, which was also about Gandhi's early years in South Africa. And in both quest in both of these works, they Joseph Lelyveld less intentionally, that's what people were taking away from his book, although that wasn't exactly what he was trying to do. And they uh uh Gulam and Vahid are their last names uh, in the South African Gandhi. They were more explicit in their and fiercer in their critique. Um, pointed out that Gandhi during his time in South Africa, in fact, was not a universalist and in fact was a racist and that he said terribly vile and racist kinds of things while he was in South Africa directed against the native black population of Africa. 
Uh, and then um, that led to, a, I'm sure you know of a famous movement um, in, in uh, particularly in Southern Africa called Roads Must Fall, um, which is about undoing the legacy of Cecil Rhodes and uh, the kind of pedestal he's put upon still because of the Rhodes Scholarship and the eminent place he holds at Oxford and so on. Um, so a, a similar movement arose called Gandhi Must Fall parallel movement called Gandhi must fall. And one of the reasons for this was because South Africans were like, why the heck sh should we put this person on a pedestal when it turns out he was a racist and he said terribly racist things. So now that kind of raises a, a variety of kinds of issues that I think are worth debating. And I don't want to sit and have the full debate here, but I would say that I don't, it is not at all untrue was Gandhi racist while he was in South Africa? 100%. Did he say racist things while he was there? 100%. Do you know why? Because he was in a racist society, trained as a racist, under a racist education system, and he lived a racist life. Not only did he lead a, a racist life, he, he lived a casteist life and a, and a quite a patriarchally gendered life um, because that's the system in which he was operating and he was trained to think that way. What he began to do in South Africa, and this happened while he was in South Africa, was to begin to undo and raise some questions about the things he was saying and doing. But it was not until he came back to India and encountered Jawaharlal Nehru that he truly began to have a very different conception of uh, ideas of race. It is also obviously true that he began to have a tremendous influence on Black intellectuals and activists around the world, including people like W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and ultimately Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. And so, you know, when we talk about the fact that this person was in fact not a saint, but was in fact a very human being full of foibles and shortcomings, I think that's only when we actually do him any justice uh, as a, a figure of history, he, you know, whatever saintly qualities or powers he might have had, that doesn't equate to being a saint uh, or or some kind of superhuman. He 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 was a human being and part of a system, and uh, he made a number of errors in judgment in his life and mistakes, and he said terrible things. He himself acknowledged some of this when he said, "You know, I'm constantly evolving, and if there's any question." take what I said just now versus if there's a discrepancy between what I'm saying now and what I said last week, take what I'm saying now, because I've thought it through more and I'm thinking more clearly in the, you know, this is my, this is the better position. Now that doesn't necessarily completely let him off the hook because he would go on to say other kinds of things about say caste later on in his life as well. And so we want to be clear that though some of these things there are, there are places where you can criticize him at all various stages of his life. It's not like he just made mistakes when he was young. Muhammad and Bahid will also point out, by the way, that he was not that young when he left South Africa. And so we're not talking about a 15 or a 20 year old. We're talking about like a, a middle aged man who was saying terrible things by the time he left. True. Yes, I mean, I think that's true. OK, so now let's turn to Hitler. And I, I think it's important to set the stage to say this because you got to understand that there, everyone is a product of their time and that there are all kinds of limits. And I also want to take off the table immediately the idea that Gandhi the saint or Gandhi the superhuman was the person who's sitting there talk, saying these things about Hitler, Hitler. What we're talking about is a human being who's in the middle of the world's worst catastrophe in human history. Uh, it is true that Gandhi encountered Hitler and was not entirely sure what to do with him. And it is also true true that he said this in the 1930s when most of the rest of the world did not know what to do or make of Hitler. Two people in the world, however, saw Hitler and Mussolini rather clearly almost from the outset and certainly before people in England did. Uh, and those two people are Jawaharlal Nehru and Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. The evidence for this is clear and overwhelming and they made statements and warning against the rise of fascism because they were in Europe, they were traveling around, they were seeing what was happening. Uh, they were making statements all, uh, all the way that Europe was headed for catastrophe, that Hitler was dangerous, that Mussolini was not someone to be trusted. Um, 
and I don't want to sort of jump the gun here, but Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was detained by the police for the attempted assassination of Mussolini uh, in in the in the uh, uh, in the thirties, um, and the, that's sort of an accidental kind of set of events, but it had happened, and she was she knew who he was, and she was uh, concerned. Um, they were staunchly anti-fascist from the beginning. And I want to be clear that they made these anti-fascist statements before Winston Churchill ever did. Um, and Winston Churchill, by the way, is not the person who's the source of Britain's anti-fascism. Um, it was his parliamentary secretary, Robert Boothby, who we encountered in the town hall debate with Madame Pandit. So Boothby was the one who kind of warned, ultimately warned Churchill. And then uh, after uh, uh, the failure of the Runciman mission and Chamberlain does his whole thing, that uh, um, Churchill delivers his famous remarks on appeasement. Uh, and um, before Churchill did that, um, Nehru and uh, and uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit had made um, uh, had been very clear, uh, warning against uh, fascism and its problems uh, and its dangers from the beginning. And they had also blasted Chamberlain uh, for uh, what he did to Czechoslovakia, uh, as again, before Churchill. So let's just sort of establish all of that before we get to Gandhi. Now, let's get to Gandhi, and he's sitting there and talking about uh, Hitler. It's true that Gandhi is... He, he's first he thinks that nonviolence is important and is a mechanism for defense. He's not just telling Europe uh, to engage in nonviolence. He's telling India to be prepared to resist only nonviolently. Now, Gandhi, by this point, even many people who are his closest friends and associates, this is the late 1930s and very early 1940s, many people are beginning to question whether he's kind of gotten unstable and whether he's really got it all together upstairs. Uh, and so they're, they're concerned because he's saying all kinds of things. And there are there is real tension inside of the Indian nationalist movement or anti-colonial movement rather about what kind of place, how do we, you know, they want to, he's very important, but how do we mm, sort of engage with him and with a difference of opinion? And many of them are staunchly anti-fascist and pro getting involved in the war. The key difference is that what they want is full independence so that they can side with the allies. I don't, I won't get into all of those details here. It is true that in the late 1930s, uh, Hitler, I'm sorry, Gandhi addresses a number of letters to Hitler uh, addressed as my uh, my friend Hitler, I think is his is the way he addresses him, my friend Hitler. Um, and he addresses him in a variety of ways. Now, when you go into the records, it's very clear that the reason he's doing this is because for Gandhi, Hitlerism and British imperialism are two sides of the same coin. Now, to Western ears, this can be very grating. This can be like, what the hell are you talking about? Hitler is not the British, Im British imperial system, which was about courts and railways and justice. And, you know, yes, it was, it was a bit racist and it did these things, but it was ultimately a beneficent organization. Well, to that, I would say that the Mau Mau in Kenya would completely disagree. Uh, and the kind of much more brutal aspects of the British Empire are the kinds of things that Gandhi focused on. And India had itself been subjected to that kind of brutal violence in a variety of places, the most, the kind of the biggest uh, event of which had occurred in 1919 at this Garden Amritsar massacre. Uh, and so um, now, okay, be that as it may, these kinds of equate two sides of the same coin they didn't equate, and I need to be clear about this, British imperialism with Hitlerism. Um, they understood that Hitlerism was worse than British imperialism. What they said was that they were the same thing on a spectrum and that British imperialism would ultimately lead to Hitlerism. And so it, it, it ends in Hitler-like activity. It can, it can kind of position itself a little bit differently, but the end logic of it is the same. So uh, uh, he did try in a number of instances to try to get Hitler to see reason and to do his Gandhi-like thing. His Gandhi-like thing was to say that, um, his Gandhi-like thing, you know why? Because he was Gandhi. 
I mean, it's sort of obvious, right? That he would uh, reach out and say, uh, I don't see you as an enemy. I see you as uh, a product of history and we can work together and find solutions. And, uh, you know, he did his thing uh, and it failed. And for a long time, Gandhi was very confused about this. He wasn't really sure what to do. And uh, I've described this as um, that's because it took him a while to figure out that Hitler was the Moriarty to his homes. You know, like he's his antithesis. He's the manifestation of violence, Hitler, to Gandhi's manifestation of nonviolence. Um, and so, you know, the to deal, to meet your, your anti-self can sometimes be hard to recognize, and it was for him. Uh, and so it took him some time to sort of figure out uh, what to do. But by the kind of 1941, 1942, it was much clearer to everyone all over the world, the kind of existential threat that Hitler posed. Uh, and then the question was what they needed to do. Now, all of this is a buildup because the centerpiece of my book, as you may recall, although we haven't gotten to it yet, but it is coming, uh, is the 1942 Quit India Resolution. And the 1942 Quit India Resolution is where Nehru, the Indians explicitly call for World Federation uh, and that that's going to be the solution that's going to help save the planet from Hitlerism and all of these things. Further, the Quit India Resolution 1942 August is what specifically also says that um, India will join with the allies. And th this is a war declaration, essentially. It says, make us independent and we will fight with the allies to defeat the scourge of fascism and Nazism in the world. Uh, and then to keep, to build a better world and to keep the peace, we're gonna uh, have, we need World Federation. That's Nehru who wrote that declaration, but the original one was written by Gandhi. And in that he explicitly said similar kinds of things, Joseph, to what you just said, which is where he continued to 1942 to say, we will non-violently resist. Uh, in, Indians side with the allies, but what we will do is we will non-violently resist the Axis and we will allow the British to come in and fight on our territory uh, against these forces. That was the way he'd framed it. Uh, and the entire Congress was like, well, that's very nice, but that's not what we really want to say here. What we want to say is we will fight. Um, and they made the distinction, many Gandhians made the distinction that when you're faced now with the existential threat faced by violence, that it was time for violence. And by the way, Gandhi himself at many points in his life was also very clear. If you don't have the choice of using nonviolence and you're faced with evil, you have no choice but to be violent and violent resistance is then called for. Um, but he also was clear many times over that nonviolence he saw as the ultimate weapon uh, and far preferable to using violence. So um, all of this is to say that mm, the story is much more complicated uh, than, um, you know, it's, it's not just he said something crazy and therefore we should dismiss him as a kook or as someone, I mean, although many people obviously did, um, but, you know, the, the distinction between ge geniuses and visionaries and kooks can often be very slim. Uh, and so, um, you know, he he did sometimes uh, um, not necessarily see things clearly. And before I end on this point, and I know I've talked a long time here in this answer, but before I end, I do want to say one other thing, which is that after all of this, it's after all of this that India descends into total chaos and mass violence where everyone is killing one another. And only one person, only one person stops all of that. And that person is Gandhi. Uh, he he single-handedly stops millions of people from killing themselves, killing one another. He single-handedly does it. And the way he does it is by the deployment of his famous methods and he fasts unto death and he calls everyone's attention to himself. I can get into all the details of why this works and, and how it does, but he calls all the people's attention to himself and single-handedly, single-handedly, he stops it. Uh, it's called his finest hour. Um, and so after this period where he does this other stuff, he demonstrates the power of nonviolence uh, to stop it. And finally, one last thing I know, I just said that, but I'm gonna say one more thing, uh, which is the other point about um, whether or not nonviolence would work against uh, the Nazis was, 
uh, that it was, and, and people, some people have been talking about this a little bit, is that um, there were elements uh, inside of Jewish ghettos uh, where nonviolence, res nonviolent resistance was offered in a variety of ways repeatedly. Um, and while the claim was not that, uh, you know, it worked, although in, in, uh, in some instances uh, it, it was important to do um, and he does make kind of complicated assertions there about it will ultimately triumph. And if it doesn't triumph, you know, sort of they'll have the moral victory. Um, and he does sort of equivocate on these points at that particular at, at that particular juncture. But, um, you know, the place of nonviolence is something that um, uh, is very complicated and um, its potential and its power has, in fact, been proven uh, against quite brutal violence uh, in a number of occasions. Um, and so I would leave it up in the air uh, a bit more than to sort of definitively say that there's no way on earth that it would ever, ever, ever work uh, in certain circumstances. I think, again, one must approach each of these, each issue in, in an individual kind of context and then see uh, what the situation calls for. Um, okay, that was almost 20 minutes, 18 minutes. Uh, so, so first of all, thank you, Joseph, for such a challenging question that uh, teased out such a brilliant and interesting answer from Manu. Um, we have two more questions. Uh, oh, sorry, I get the ear because my microphone is up. I hope you all heard that. Um, Rebecca, um, you were first and then Donna. Um, Rebecca, I suppose you have a commented response you were asked for. And uh, Donna, if you have a question to wrap up. We do have 10 minutes for notes um, and, and uh, notices um, that you wanted to bring forward. Maybe we can use five minutes of that time uh, just to wrap this up because it's been so interesting. Uh, thank you. And yes, I do have more than a comment, uh, more of a comment than a question. Um, I was queued up, I think, actually by both David. So so thank you. Um, but uh, just a few observations connecting today's discussion in the book to contemporary questions of accountability structures within global governance, um, particularly around legal accountability. Um, so I will note that um, I was this week at a closed door high level strategy session around uh, this document, the uh, breakthrough for people on the planet, which the UN Secretary General has, excuse my notes on it. I'll put the, the link uh, in the chat in a, sec in a second, um, which the UN Secretary General has commissioned as part of his, our common agenda um, to extrapolate clear policy goals leading up to the summit of the future for effective inclusive global governance for today and the future. And I noted at that point this week um, in the discussion with um, uh, 38th floor folks, i.e. from the Secretary General's office, with members of the Biden administration, that in the 86 page report, accountability is mentioned um, a couple dozen times, but never in the context of legal or judicial accountability. And when um, David Gallup was asking the question um, about whether or not Madame Pandit had influence over the creation of the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, I, it struck me that there was a similarity with the themes that are in this report that look at accountability first from the standpoint of treaty bodies and the UN High Commissioner, in this case, uh, as being a, a special rapporteur type organ for human rights. Um, and that look at pact making and commitment making on behalf of states, but don't look at accountability in the form of what happens if you don't keep commitments and where the consequences are, which is where the judicial organs come in. Um, and I will note just as a fun fact that, you know, Navi Pillay, the uh, esteemed UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and also Chief Judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, um, former uh, Chief of the International Commission of Jurists, is often mentioned with Madame Pandit in the same breadth as uh, the most illustrious women leaders at the UN and um, coincidentally is of Indian uh, descent, a South African of Indian descent. Um, so what we're missing, I think, in this narrative is the discussion of not only existing uh, judicial institutions, and here I will say a little bit about the ICC, um, 
in the ICJ. Um, but as uh, David Gallup pointed out, new judicial institutions, because both of those institutions, ICC has um, jurisdiction over individual criminal responsibility, and ICJ has jurisdiction over disputes among states. And while some countries and some citizens of some states have recourse to regional human rights tribunals, what is missing is a tribunal or a court, as uh, David advocates for, uh, that addresses the needs of all of humanity. With regards to the ICC in particular, I think most people on this call know that I actually follow in Bill Pace's footsteps, um, and he's a great friend and mentor of mine as the current convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court. And I can only imagine how uncomfortable for so many reasons it must be to walk through a hall of portraits of dictators and um, uh, war criminals or alleged war criminals or those who are alleged to have committed genocide or crimes against humanity. Uh, the number one question or the number one um, misconception that I'm often asked to debunk within my role as an advocate for the ICC and a former member, full disclosure, of the ICC staff within the Office of the Presidency is the Africa problem. Um, and I do note um, the easiest way to debunk this is to look at the number of cases that originated on the African continent by self-referral of states. Only two uh, cases have ever come before the, uh, the ICC by UN Secretary um, Security Council, excuse me, referral, and they are on the African content, continent, Sudan and Libya, not normally what we think about um, when we think about the uh, dictators that the ICC has um, held to, or tried to help hold justice on the continent. And then the vast majority of those cases have not come proprio moto, proprio moto being when the Office of the Prosecutor initiates proceedings of their own initiative, but have become uh, at the referral of states um, based on the principle of complementarity that they are unable or unwilling within their own domestic judicial systems to confront uh, the crimes within the court's jurisdiction of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Um, our newest program uh, that will actually, and I'm going to ask Drea for a plug here um, in the chat at some point, uh, which is actually formally going to launch um, during UN Disarmament Week, um, a week from Monday, October 23rd, at the U.S. Baha'i International Center, is Legal Alternatives to War, which really embodies, I think, a lot of the themes that we've been discussing and that appear throughout the book. This is looking primarily at the International Court of Justice, the primary judicial organ envis envisioned by the UN Charter as a pathway to Pacific resolution of disputes. And here, the United States and India actually have a similarly complex, and I'm probably being euphemistic, um, I think I mean problematic uh, relationship with the ICJ. Um, both have had a judge on the ICJ um, I think almost it's entire the entirety of its existence. There have been periods where India, I think, lapsed, but currently has a, India has a judge, and currently the chief judge, uh, the president, is an American, Jen Donahue. Um, both avail themselves of the court when it behooves them. India uh, notably brought suit against uh, Pakistan um, regarding detention and potential execution of an Indian national. Uh, and both have been on the receiving end, um, uh, the non-moving party in disputes, uh, one in which both the United States and India were respondents, was on the obligation, brought by the Marshall Islands, was on the obligation of uh, nuclear states. It was addressed to all nine nuclear powers um, to disarm and fulfill their obligations. And uh, ultimately, the case did not proceed as a matter of jurisdiction because the court determined that there was not an active dispute between the parties. Um, but demonstrates how the court could be used as um, an instrument for the, the peaceful one world uh, that we're all looking at, that it doesn't take an individual with um, great magnetism and charisma and willing to make personal sacrifices, Gandhi was, uh, to go on a hunger strike, but that there can be recourse within a global governance system that is reliable, um, that is um, uh, e e expected, um, and hopefully consistent um, in its resolution of disputes. Um, and so I think I would just leave with the fact that, um, oh, and I hope that, that Drea, maybe you can put in the chat um, uh, the Legal Alternatives to War program, that will we take inspiration from these great figures, from Madame Pandit, from Gandhi, et cetera, 
extrapolation of what they stand for throughout um, institutional mechanisms is I hope what we can strive for in terms of the global governance for today and the future. Um, and I'm sorry for going on a little bit of a polemic. <laughs> My name was invoked and I, when ICC is mentioned, I do have to, to, to chime in, but thank you so much, Manu, for the wonderful presentation of the wonderful book. And I look forward to continuing with many of these conversations. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I will just say um, to all of you that Rebecca has put several comments and links in the uh, comments uh, to the, to the um, Zoom call. Um, you can avail yourself of those at your leisure. Um, and then finally, um, Manu, would you like to re respond to any of that or should we go to Donna? Um, I know, pass. I I'm not going to ask my question. I'm fine. Oh, I'll hold okay. it to another time. Thank you, Donna. Um, In that case, Manu, it's for you to wrap up and then we'll go to any other business. Okay. All right, Donna, no problem. We can, we can always chat in the future. Uh, no, I don't have much to say, Rebecca. Thank you for uh, all those clarifying points. Um, yeah, I, I'll just leave it to say that um, you know the I'm I'm not a skeptic of the ICC. I think that uh, it's a good thing. I mean, I think it's a good thing. But I uh, and other than that, I don't have anything to say other than to thank all of you for spending so much of your time, like sitting and listening to me. Um, just go on and on and uh, also for taking the time to show so much interest in this book. Um, this is my new book. Uh, you can kind of get a sense yep, for I see it. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, coming out in December um, and maybe I can talk more about that in the next session. That would be great. Um, so that just leads us to any other business. Um, Manu, we'll stay on the call once we're finished, if you'd just like to stay here for a few minutes. Does anybody else on the call have any announcements they'd like to make or any points they'd like to bring forward for the rest of the book club? No hands raised. Anybody not raising a hand digitally that wants to say anything they can give me a wave right now? Nope, nothing. Okay, well then it's just to say thanks a lot. Uh, oh, Shirley, you were waving goodbye or you were waving to speak? You're waving goodbye. Okay. Um, wonderful session today. You've pitched up some great questions, which Manu has hit out of the park. Um, we look forward to the next book club session. Uh, Gail Hughes will be um, disseminating times and dates. Um, other than that, just like to say thank you to everybody. <laughs>